services folks are a very forgiving bunch. Um, so we are going to jump into the Make It Count, the Flip Summer Reading Statistics webinar. Um, and while we're going sort of through this beginning, I know a lot of you have uh, put in the chat which library you're from, and that's wonderful. And if you haven't done that already, I'd love to hear which library you are from. And also share a favorite, current favorite children's or YA book that maybe you recently read or recently discovered that you are just super excited about. Um, I would love to hear what you all are, are currently reading or recommending to your, your kids and teens. So by the time we get done today, um, you're going to be able to know why we collect these summer reading statistics and how they're helpful for your library and also how we use them at the state and federal levels. You'll know which data you need to collect. Um, and then we'll take a look at Counting Opinions, which is the program that we use for collecting the summer program statistics. So we're gonna start with why. Why are we collecting statistics? Why are we asking this of you? Um, but we'll talk about how we use them, how they impact you. So locally um, at your library, we use them to help determine the allotment amount that you all receive every year. So we take the program attendance numbers and we put them into uh, a formula and that's what gives us our allotments. Um, but it also helps provide the story, part of the story, for what your library is doing and how you're impacting your community. And you can use those numbers and those stories to take to your city or county commissioners or your other funders to really show this, the type of impact that you all are having locally, because we know that you're having an impact. But then it also, for you, it helps identify the trends, what's popular, what your patrons want, and also what their needs are. Um, you know, I know this past year has been so different and, and it seems like now over the last year, the rest of the world has sort of realized that the, the digital divide is a thing, you know, and that's something that we in the library world have been talking about for years. And so being able to identify what those are, um, helps the library to be proactive in meeting those needs. And then one thing that's been really exciting this past year, even though we know all the challenges that you all have had, is that I've heard many, many library staff across the state talk about with, um, they've been able to look at their statistics and see who they're reaching. And because so much programming has gone virtual that they've been able to reach patrons who normally can't come into the library facility. And so they've been able to identify who those populations are and moving forward. I know a lot of you have talked about continuing to keep some of this digital programming, even when you're able to do in-person programming because it's allowed you to reach new people in your community. And that's really exciting. And then Nancy's gonna share a little bit about the state and federal level and how your statistics and your data is used for that. Sure, um, to echo what Casey said about the local level, the data collected from the summer program survey is used to compile a statewide view of community needs. It can also help us spot shifting trends and services that libraries across the state provide. And when we take this data and analyze it along with other library data collected throughout the year, it paints a broad picture of library service in Florida, and we can share those compiled statistics with our state leaders. At the Division of Library and Information Services, our entire bureau staff and all our programs are fully funded by federal grants from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The IMLS has certain reporting requirements that are standard across the whole country, and these statistics help us meet those requirements. Uh, just like you do at the, your local level, these statewide statistics help us make the case for how beneficial and far-reaching our federal dollars are. We can show that Florida libraries are consistently impacting their communities through these personal stories and compelling numbers. And, as Casey said, especially in light of all the creative challenges that still exist this summer in planning and carrying out your reading programs, 
it's very important that we have all the possible programs that you put all your efforts into counted and credited. Absolutely. Are there any questions so far about why we collect, how they're used? And one thing I tried to do last year was um, take those stats and turn them into an infographic just to give um, a glimpse into um, into what this look, you know, what summer summer programs look like on a statewide level. And I have to say, if you didn't see that infographic, um, you know, one thing that was so surprising. Um, but really amazing was that, you know, despite all the challenges, despite the closures, you all, um, I think the stat was something like, um, you all provided about 54% fewer programs, but you only reached about 16% fewer people. So it came down to about 100,000 people fewer than the previous year. And I think that just shows the, the reach and the impact despite all the challenges, because you all are amazing and we know that you're amazing. <laughs> and I'm not seeing any hand raises and I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. So we'll keep moving forward. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what types of data that you need to collect and Nancy's going to start us off by talking about active programs. Sure. Um, well, for the purpose of the survey, you're going to be counting two types of programs, active and self-directed. For the active programs, that's probably the most familiar kind of program for our purposes. Active programs are conducted before a live audience. They can be interactive, but they don't have to be. They can be in person and they can also be virtual. The key qualifier for being an active program is being in real time. And self-directed programming on the flip side are programs that are not in real time. And so these are not conducted before a live audience. Um, your community members and patrons can access them whenever it's convenient for them. Um, so some of the examples we saw from this last year were the Google Doc escape rooms, um, story time videos that were recorded but then viewed after the live stream. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, live videos that are then left up uh, community scavenger hunts, um, make and take kits. You all did an amazing job getting very creative on these self-directed programs. But the key here is that they are not live. And so we're going to look at an example um, on how a single program idea can sort of be both self-directed and active. Um, and there are sometimes opportunities for a single program to be um, run in a couple different ways where you're able to count it as both self-directed and then also as active and we'll talk about that here um, and Peggy had a question in the chat how do we count Facebook live done in a studio all by ourselves and Peggy we'll talk a little bit about counting uh, those numbers in a little bit but the good thing is that um, social media captures those numbers so you don't have to try to count them as you're live doing doing it because social media especially I know Facebook's really good about that um, however there was some recent news about Facebook and we'll talk about this again in a little bit um, where their, their uh, regular analytics are going away in June. And so that's something that um, I know we at the Bureau are trying to anticipate. And if you hadn't heard that, um, I recommend you look into it. So that way you can kind of start coming up with an alternate way of collecting that, that data because it may not be there the way that we need it to be there. And we're still, I, I wish I had more information on that. Um, to provide to you, but it sort of just hit us. Um, so if I learn more, I will certainly share that out. 
Um, I know, I know, I know. Uh, you know, Facebook, they keep us on our toes. Um, and Jordan said Creator Studio provides many statistics and analytics. Yeah, and, and there are other ways through Facebook that they plan on making analytics available, but it's just those typical normal analytics that you would pop into, that is what's going away because they're trying to shift things to all be more in one spot. Um, so it's worth looking into if you hadn't heard that yet, just to sort of see what your options are. Um, so let's take a look here about um, of a program that can be both self-directed and active um, and the type of program where you may be able to count it as two separate programs. And so we're gonna use the example of take home craft kits or make and takes, whatever your library has, has called them. Um, and so just a take home craft kit would be a self-directed program. And it's technically a passive self-directed. I know in the past we've used terms like passive programming um, and passive programming is technically self-directed, but you know, not all self-directed is completely passive. And that's why here on the screen, you're seeing sort of two different columns where we talk about passive versus interactive. Um, so, you know, if your library just sets up a week where you tell your patrons, hey, come by the library, you can pick up a take-home craft kit and they pick it up and they take it, uh, and that's the end of it, then that is a passive self-directed program. And, you know, you would count the number of kits that the people take with them. You could make that a little bit more interactive by not only having them pick up the take-home craft kit, but if you had a pre-recorded instructional video, um, and then maybe you were doing Q&A in the comments where people could come in just at any point and ask questions and then staff would just sort of randomly pop in and, and answer, um, but it's not a set live time, then that is also self-directed. If you're having a hard time sort of distinguishing whether something is a passive self-directed or an interactive self-directed, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, we aren't breaking them down that specifically in, in the data collection. Um, so it's really just self-directed versus active. And then Nancy's gonna talk a little bit about how that same idea could be used to then create an active program. Right, um, a, an active program would be a real-time event with a live audience in this case. Uh, this can be in-person or virtual. And to use the craft kit example, families might pick up a craft kit from the cart on their own time, but before the live event, and then join library staff for a live stream of a let's make this craft together session. This would be an active program. If you live session, if your live session is recorded, you would count it as an active program, of course. If you put it on YouTube or Facebook, you can then count it as a self-directed program also. Yeah, so it's always kind of nice when you can take one program and have it count for you a little differently. Um, we do have a question in the chat um, from Matthew. Hi, Matthew. I haven't seen your name in a long time. <laughs> um, he said, we often have downloadable activities as part of on live lives, online live sessions. If we get numbers on how many are downloaded, would that count as a self-directed add-on stat? Yes, so that would be sort of that self-directed part. So you would count that as your self-directed program. And then if you're having an online live session, then the number of attendees would be um, counted as that live session. And so we're gonna move on to just a note on virtual program that Nancy's gonna talk about. Yeah, just to, uh... Just to say again that virtual programming also counts. Count your live virtual events as active programs and then count the attendees to the live events as active program attendants. For the self-directed portion of virtual programs, you are counting views of recordings after an event. This is when participation is considered part of the passive or self-directed programming. And you'll count the views that are watched of a recording um, that last a minute or longer as a participant in these programs. 
And Susan posted a question in the chat. What about a passive programming set up in the library where children complete the activity on their own while in the library? That would be self-directed. So you would just count the number um, of kids who completed that activity. So you'll wanna make sure that there's a way to count that. Um, I know I've seen some libraries where they've set up passive programming um, you know, by doing different activities around the library and they sort of checked off a list as they went through and they turned that into library staff um, so that they had a way to count it. Um, Olivia, uh, I may have missed this, but what is the difference for whether the programming is active or self-directed? Is it just weighted differently in the formula? So the difference between active or self-directed, Olivia, is that an active program is something that is happening live and in the moment. Um, so if you're having a live storybook on Facebook, that is your active programming. Um, if you are actually, I know some libraries are starting to dip their toes into in-person programming. Um, you know, so if you're having a Lego club in your library, that's your active programming. Self-directed is that, you know, it's a program where community members can do it whenever they feel like it or whenever is convenient for them, um, but staff don't have to be there live. Um, and then I'm assuming for the formula, you're talking about the allotment. Um, I honestly, I am still trying to figure out how best to work the allotment this year because, um, you know, the intention is not to necessarily count them differently, but I'm still trying to figure out the most equitable way to, to work the allotment this year. Um, because if we go by the straight numbers, then, um, the allotment amounts are coming up sort of skewed where, you know, one library will come out saying that they get $35,000 for an allotment and it's a library that normally gets about $1,000 and then some of our larger systems, because of the way the allotment just runs straight, was, you know, getting like $700 versus the, the $10,000 they might normally get. Um, so they're not weighed differently in the formula, um, but I'm also still trying to figure out what that's gonna look like this year to make it equitable because I don't want to throw anybody in a huge flux. Um, so, um, and so I'm seeing a lot of very program specific questions coming through and I want to, um, I want to make sure that we're able to get through all of the content. Um, I will say that if at any point during this you're having very program specific questions, please feel free to email me and reach out to me and I'm happy to discuss it then. Um, and so I don't, I don't want you to feel like I'm ignoring you, but I do wanna make sure that we're able to get through all of this and we could probably spend an entire day of just people putting out specific programs and asking how to count it. Um, and so, I want to try to, um, yes, Darlie, we're going to talk specifically about outreach here in a little bit. Um, so I'm going to keep moving forward because I think once we, um, I think once we move forward, I think we'll have some of these questions answered. Um, so talking a little bit more about virtual programming, um, each social media platform shows their live views a little differently. So going back to um, the question earlier about how to count stats, um, typically, you know, those stats are available during a live view, but if you are a one person show, it's gonna be very, very difficult for you to try to keep up with how many people are viewing, especially as they come in and go. Um, and so typically those analytics are available after the fact. Um, and, and they look a little different for each social media platform. And so if you're, if you're going live on YouTube, those stats are probably gonna look a little different than if you're pulling them from Facebook, um, or if you're doing it in Zoom, which I know is a whole different, a whole different way to collect information. Um, but the good thing is that for most of them, you can typically access them after the fact. You don't have to try to capture them right then and there. Um, I will say too that sometimes they use different terminology to mean the same thing. 
Uh, and so, you know, that might be worth, if you're not as familiar, just sort of looking around and seeing how they call different things. You know, it might be engagement on one platform and views on another, um, but ultimately they boil down to the same thing. Um, we do recommend that you pull your views of recordings just before you submit your flip summer statistics. And this is really for the self-directed videos. Um, you know, your live view, once it's done and over with, that number is not going to change. Uh, it's going to remain the same. But um, we don't have any sort of restriction where, you know, we're only counting self-directed video views a week after the fact. Um, so you don't, you don't have to, it's just the best, you know, the best way to make sure you're getting as much of a count as you can, um, without maybe cutting yourself short there. Thank you, Peggy. <laughs> and Nancy's going to talk a little bit about hybrid programming. Sure. Um, so a program can take place in person and virtually at the same time. Um, it would count as one program and you would combine the attendance count for both. Although the virtual attendance might be a little harder to capture for live participants. But this, this was what we refer to as a hybrid program. And it, an example might be like an animal program with in-person patrons that's also being live streamed over social media. So both both components are live and it counts as an active program. Um, if in this case there's a recording um, that remains available after the live event, those views that are one minute or longer would then be counted as a separate self-directed program. And Sherry, I see your hand is up. I have unmuted you. So if you have a question, you are more than welcome to go ahead and, oh. and talk. Sorry. <laughs> are you good? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and just another note about hybrid programming, and this isn't so much, um, data related but um you know you just want to make sure too that if you are going to do some sort of hybrid programming where you are recording live that um that you know your external presenters are okay with that um that you're not you know in, you know accidentally violating one of their policies but if you're also going to have patrons in that video you want to make sure that you're following whatever your local policy is for um, permission to put them up on the web so just food for thought <laughs> um, and there is a question in the chat is there a standard for the time length of view does a three second video on a video count as attendance so we look for anything a minute or longer um, because you know if somebody just pops in for a few seconds that's sort of the equivalent of somebody walking past your programming room and just peeking their head in to see what's going on and then they continue on their way um, you know we wouldn't count those folks who just sort of stop and look for a second and then keep going but you know if they if they've sat there for a minute that's kind of the equivalent of coming into the room and, and sitting down um, so oh good i'm glad that makes sense <laughs> Uh, so just a couple notes on the virtual statistics. Um, you know, you can't see the audience. And even if you could, um, we don't count the programs based on the age of the people who are attending, whether that's in person or virtual. So you count your program based on the intended age. And if this is your first year doing these statistics, you'll see here in a little bit that we break these uh, stats down based on age groupings. And so, um, you know, if you're putting out a, a, you know, elementary school program, whether that's in person or virtual, you know, you wouldn't sit here and, and necessarily try to count, you know, well, we have six 10-year-olds and seven 11-year-olds and, you know, three adults. You just count them all in the age group that that program is intended for. 
Um, one thing I do want to point out for those libraries who are going to continue doing virtual story times or virtual programs that are aimed at really young children, like our early literacy age, you can probably make a pretty safe assumption that there is an adult sitting there. Um, and so while they'll show up as one view, if it's, you know, a story time typically geared towards three and four year olds, um, while, while our three and four year olds, four year olds are, you know, significantly more tech savvy than we probably were when we were that age, they're, they're probably not still logging on to, to a Facebook account by themselves. And so you could go ahead and assume that there's two people sitting there um, because that child's going to have a grown up nearby. You can't make that assumption for older, you know, programs that are intended for older kids and teens because it's very possible that they are there by themselves. But that's just food for thought. Um, I know some people have actually asked people to put in the comment section, you know, how many people are sitting there, um, you know, which is fine. That's completely a local choice um, and just hope that people are self-reporting. Um, and so one of the other things that I did want to point out is that uh, there are a lot of libraries that continue sort of their, their regularly scheduled programs throughout the summer, but they're not related to the summer library programs. And so I want to make sure that you all know that when it comes to these specific summer library program statistics, we are only collecting data for programs that are part of these programs. Um, so for instance, if you have a knitting group that's been meeting virtually year round um, and they just continue to meet during the summer, but they're not in any way actually connected to your Tales and Tales summer library program, you wouldn't count that. That would go on the annual statistical report, not your summer library program. Now you may have annual programs that go into the summer that shift their focus to that summer library program theme during the summer. And so even though it is a regularly scheduled program, um, if it does sort of transform in the summertime, like your story times might, um, then you absolutely can count those. Um, and then there is a question, if we host a live event and then post the recording, does that count as two events? Yes. Um, so your live event is the live active programming. So if it's a live story time um, and you have 10 people who view that live recording for a minute or longer, then you would count that as one active programming or one active program with 10 people. And then if you leave it up and go back and check those numbers right before you submit and say you've had 20 views um, that 20 people who viewed that after the fact who were a minute and longer then you would count that as one self-directed program um, with 20 views um, do story times other youth programs have to stick with theme to count they have to be part of your summer program. I know just through the brainstorming sessions we had, especially the ones that were focused more on teens, um, a lot of you staff talked about how hard this year's theme is really for older teens. Um, it kind of lends itself a little bit better to the younger um, the younger crowd. And so the I think it's just, if you are setting up this program as part of your summer library program, um, then you know that's that's sort of the difference. But I do know a lot of people have talked about struggling with this particular theme in the teens, and so a lot of a lot of staff are choosing not to um, dive too deep into the tales and tales theme, but they are still actively planning programming that they wouldn't normally do during during the summer. I mean, during the school year. Um, and then I've got a great question, Mandy. Thank you for this. We can only count the summer food program if we were doing it in person with a program surrounding it, correct? If we are doing grab and go for summer food program again this year, that doesn't count, correct? Correct. Um, while we wholly support libraries doing the summer food program and it's amazing and 
Um, at some point, I know people always have a lot of questions for libraries who do this. Um, I would love to pull those libraries in who are doing this just to sort of talk about that. Um, but the summer food program does not count as a summer library program for the purpose of statistics. But there are libraries who will wrap programming around that. Um, so I know whenever when when we were doing a lot of in-person programming, there were libraries that would have a story time and a craft and then um, either right before or right after the summer food pickup. So um, they were getting people who were coming for the food program who would then also attend um, a program. If you're doing a grab and go kit and it's, hey, come pick up your food, come pick up your kit, the kit, is, the, the make and take kit is what would be your, your self-directed program, not the food program portion. And then outreach. Um, so let's talk a little bit about outreach because outreach does count as part of your programming. Um, I know that many of you are still unable to get out into your communities for your typical outreach activities. Um, a lot of schools are still not letting people on campus except for staff and students. Um, daycares are still, you know, at, at the front door only. I know my child's daycare is, we still can't go in the building. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't do virtual outreach activities. Um, and then of course, if some of you are able to start doing some of these in-person in outreach. Um, so let's talk a little bit though about the difference between outreach and marketing. And I, I think whenever everybody's able to do in-person outreach, it's a lot easier to draw that line between what counts as outreach um, and what is marketing, but it's a little harder when you're in this, this digital space that we are all currently in. Uh, Matthew asked a question, is outreach active programs or is, it its, or is it its own category? So outreach is not its own category. Um, it is either self-directed or active programming. So it can still be both just like your typical, um, your typical programming. Um, and so, and, and it's right there on that first bullet that you would count outreach activities as programming. Um, so the difference between marketing and outreach, and, and this is not an official, you know, marketing definition. Um, I'm not a marketer, <laughs> but the way I, I find the easiest way for me to tell the difference is that an outreach activity is something that I would be able to do if I were standing in a classroom or a gymnasium or out at a local, you know, activities fair. I'm just now doing it virtually. So, for instance, if, you know, your team decided you were going to do, you know, a video skit promoting your summer library program and record that and put it up on your, your uh, you know, Facebook or YouTube or what have you, um, that would be an example of an outreach activity. And again, you would count that if you just pre-record it and you put it up, that's your self-directed program for anybody who watched it, if it you know, is a minute or longer. Um, or, you know, if you decided to do it live, then you would count that just like any live virtual programming where you can count whoever watched you live and then pick up the other self-directed. Um, Natalie said, we've been doing virtual summer program presentations for schools, parents, and partners. That's amazing. Um, and so, marketing because we don't collect marketing data as part of these particular set of statistics um, and and you may decide that you want to capture that on a local level because it can help you and you know whatever story you need to tell at your local level but but we don't need them because we don't have to report them up anywhere um, and I try not to make you all you know give us stuff that we don't actually need um, because I don't want to create more work for you um, but marketing is really going to be more like, you know, digital flyers or creating Facebook events, um, those sort of things that you wouldn't necessarily be doing, um, you know, in front of a group. Um, plus, you don't really have a way of counting. You know, if you put a, a 
flyer out there, whether you're sticking it up on your bulletin board at your library or sticking it out there on, on social media. Um, well, social media, they, they count it a little differently, but you know, if it's sitting in your library on a bulletin board, you really have no way of knowing how many people have, have walked by and viewed it. Um, and so again, moving forward at a later date, if you ever have any question about, you know, is this an outreach or is this a marketing um, event, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to, um, to provide some, some guidance or some clarity. Um, yeah, <laughs> Peggy said, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, that was a lot of information. Does anybody have any questions about, um, you know, programming types or the outreach or marketing? Again, without getting too specific about different programs, because again, I know that we could probably spend an entire day of people just putting out, you know, we're doing this type of program, how would that count? Um, um, Natalie asked, what are the dates we can count stats? Um, funny you should say that, Natalie. That's actually the very next slide coming up. <laughs> You'll hang with me for about 10 seconds. Um, Mimi said, really struggling with how to count statistics for our outdoor summer story walks. I may have no way of knowing how many people visited. And Mimi, this came up several times in um, more than one of our virtual brainstorming sessions. Um, so I'm happy to send you some ideas that other people shared on how they are counting that, um, which, you know, some people don't leave their story walks up. Um, they have it set up as more of an active programming, but there are a lot of libraries who do a self-directed. And if anybody's currently sitting on here and you have a great idea, please feel free to share it in the chat so they don't have to wait on me, but I can include some of that information as well. And whenever I send up the follow the follow up email for um, for this webinar, I'll also include all of the links and Google Docs from those brainstorming sessions if you were unable to attend. Um, I highly recommend them. They were full of amazing, brilliant ideas. Um, if you're trying to find ways to, to sort of troubleshoot. <laughs> um, are we able to count tech or fiber art live virtual classes as active events? If they are live and in time and they're part of your summer programming, then yes. If they're not really part of your summer programming, then that would get counted on the annual statistical report. Um, Judy asked, would a visitor sign in log work? Yeah, I mean, if that's how you, you know, again, I think we have to get creative. Um, on, on how you capture that. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you're gonna be relying on people to self-report, um, but, you know, taking a chance at having someone self-report is better than not having any way for them to self-report. Um, so lots of information coming through the chat and we're gonna go ahead and move forward. Um, so here are the survey dates, and I have another slide at the end with this information. And as always, I will send out lots of reminder emails, um, not because I want to nag you, but I just, I know we all get busy and I want to make sure that nobody misses, um, misses their opportunity to submit. So the actual counting opinion survey will open July 19th. Now, that does not mean that you have to wait until July 19th to start counting. Um, to Natalie's question earlier, there is no set date on when you start counting because, you know, schools get out at different times. Um, so libraries across the state start their summer programs at different times. So if you are currently doing outreach, then you would start counting. You would start counting those events now or whenever you start. The survey closes at 11.59 p.m. on August 20th, 2021. Um, this date, I know last year we sort of bumped that closure date a little bit just because um, 
schools statewide were pushing back their start date significantly and it was sort of a statewide thing. Um, this year, this date is hard and fast um, for several different reasons. Uh, one, number one, I don't think we're gonna be dealing with, um, with the same kinds of pushbacks that we were last year. Um, but also, you know, as, as Nancy talked about earlier, we use these numbers as part of our reporting up to IMLS, and this sort of puts us in line with our time frame with them of having to get these numbers up. And then because I also use these for allotments, I have to have time to be able to get all of that worked out and figured out um, and then emailed out to all, you know, 115, 120 libraries in time for you all to start shopping as early as possible. And the CSLP shop, the Collaborative Summer Library Program shop, tends to open that first week of September. Um, and so I try to make sure that y'all have what you need. So for those who want to get their order in really early, because we know earlier is better, um, can do that. <laughs> Matthew said, we'll get it in no later than 11.58 p.m. then. Um, playing with fire. Um, I, I will say, and you will probably hear me say this again, um, especially here in a minute because we're, we're about to move into the counting opinions but when you get that login please 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 pretty pretty please go ahead and log in immediately just to make sure everything is okay um, we have tested everybody's login and they've worked for us but as we all know and as today is a great example of we can't always rely on tech to not have a rough day um, so what we don't want to have happen is somebody not to have signed in. And so they are signing in at 6 p.m. on August 20th and they're running into problems and we aren't, we aren't gonna be there and available at 6 p.m. on August 20th to help troubleshoot that. So I always recommend that people double check their, their login just to make sure everything looks like it should. Um, and I will send multiple reminders throughout this time period for folks. And so y'all have heard me talk a lot. And so I'm actually gonna shift over to Nancy, who is gonna jump into the counting opinions. I will. It's a, it's a little bit awkward because I can't I can't see the screen. <laughs> Casey just is uh, um Yes. So I've got I've got you on your accessing statistics slide right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um so yeah, we're gonna give you a brief tour of counting opinions. And as she said, this is the instrument that we use to collect your summer program data. Um, are we up to the URL? Yes. Okay, uh, this will be sent to you along with your login information. And make sure you keep your login information confidential. There's only one login per location. Uh, just be aware that anyone entering information with this login can overwrite data, so you don't you don't want to share it with others. Um, if you have multiple branches or more than one summer reading coordinator, you want to combine all of your summer reading data and report them as a total. Each branch cannot enter separate data; the system won't allow it. And you, you, like I said, you don't want it overwritten one branch over another. If you're part of a cooperative. Um, understand that cooperatives have the choice between filing uh, their data and receiving their allotments as either one cooperative unit or each library within that cooperative can submit their data separately and receive their allotments separately. And if you are a cooperative who is changing how you do this so whether you know you have been submitting as one cooperative and you want to split up and have each library do this separately or if you're a cooperative who has been doing this separately and you've decided that you want to do it as one cooperative please reach out to us sooner rather than later because we'll have to go in and create um, we'll have to create those logins for you all um, and just a note, um, I will be sending out the username and password, and I will send that out to whoever my listed point of contact is. Some of you all have um, a backup that I, I am aware of, but I will also CC the director 
for all libraries, um, mainly because I just, I very firmly believe that important information should never sit with just one person. Um, but if something happens and you end up out or unavailable, um, that way somebody has had that information. Um, so my plan is to have all those logins sent out by July 5th. So if you have not seen that come through by July 5th, check your spam filter first or your spam folder, make sure I'm not hanging out um, with all the other spam. And if you don't see it there, then feel free to reach out and email me. Um, I know that especially lately, I've had some issues emailing out people and for some reason, I seem to be getting stuck behind people's firewalls. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that you all are getting that information. So July 5th is sort of that date where if you haven't heard from me, um, reach out to me. And then Nancy's gonna keep walking us through what that's gonna look like once you log in. Did we lose you, Nancy? All right, I'm not hearing her, so I'm gonna keep moving forward. Nancy and Daryl, if y'all um, if y'all pop back in, please just feel free to cut me off. Um, Nan uh, Natalie, yeah, we're gonna talk about the supplemental questions here in a minute. We're gonna go through everything. Um, so once you log in, this is what you should be looking at. Uh, you should see that big blue enter sign. Um, and you will see your library name. So thank you, Pinellas Park Public Library for being our, <laughs> our screenshot today. Um, I will say, so I know that some of you are also the same person who puts in your library's annual statistical report. And there is a glitch that we have noticed over the last couple of years. And I don't expect most of you to run into that glitch, but um, just so you are aware of it. If you log into Counting Opinions using more than one login, sometimes the system gets stuck. And so you may log in using your FLIP Summer Library Program login information, but whenever you hit that enter, you, are, you, you might find yourself looking at your locked annual statistical report. Um, I don't know why this does this. I noticed it a couple years ago when I was testing logins where I logged into Alachua County, I logged out, and then I logged in with Bay County's login information. And when I came in, it was still telling me, welcome, Alachua County. Um, and it took me about four times to realize that it really wasn't just me re-entering the wrong information. Um, so if that happens, there's two ways you can fix that. Um, you can either clear your cache and then log back in, or you can just use a different browser. And again, I don't expect most of you to run into that problem, but if you do, that's the fix for it. <laughs> Nancy, have we gotten you back yet? No. So once you log in, this is gonna be what the top of that annual, uh, the flip annual report looks like. And then if you look at the top, we have that period circled in red because typically that will default to last year. So whenever you log in, it is probably going to be sitting at uh, 2020 instead of 2021. And you'll notice that everything is grayed out. Um, it's going to look locked until you change that to 2021. And so you just click that arrow down, switch it to uh, 2021, and then you're gonna get a screen where everything, instead of being grayed out, is white in those boxes, and you're gonna be able to go in and um, enter your data there. And so um, you see most of the page here where we've got our active programming and our self-directed programming down below. Um, so you can see how we are keeping those separate. And then we've also got the definitions here. So if you kind of forget what's what, or you need to go back as a reminder. I've also done, and you will receive this in your email, and then I'll make sure to put it up on my web page as well. Um, I did create a one-page cheat sheet just because I like having those. It keeps me from having to log into systems all the time. Um, and so, 
hopefully you all find that helpful. Um, so I'll be sending that out as well. And it's also really helpful because, you know, you may have multiple staff members who have information to contribute, but only one login. So it's great to be able to spread it around for everybody. So you can see here, if I enlarge that, um, the, how we have these split up from the age groups. So we've got that early literacy, zero to five, school age, six to 11, young adult, 12 to 18, and adult 19 and older, and then all ages. Um, the all ages programming, that's for you know any of those programs that really aren't geared towards one specific age group. Um, we do have a spot for all of that because sometimes your programs are you know, meant for all ages. So we do have a spot for that as well. Um, so, and just a reminder that whenever you're collecting this, you're not trying to determine the age of the attendees. You're gonna count those under the age for which the program is intended. Um, these currently, these age brackets do not align with those that are on the annual statistical report that library directors are required to submit. So if you are the person who does that, you'll notice that this doesn't necessarily align there. We did change these last year because at the time they were a little bit more in line with IMLS. Um, and it's really kind of how a lot of our programs are broken down. And I think we've got Daryl and Nancy back. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we're currently Hi. on, hey, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so self-directed, again, at same age groups, um, it's just a little bit further down on the page. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the second section you'll see for self-directed programs, um, and this would be anything that you wouldn't count as active or real time. And by the way, the totals will self fill once you hit the save button. All right. So moving on to the next se section, the FLIP resources and CSLP resources. Um, this is the part of the survey that really gives um, you all the chance to give me feedback on what's working for you and what's not working for you. Um, so, you know, it's yes, no, did not use uh, the manuals, the CSLP materials, the FLIP website, which has just gone through a huge, huge, huge facelift and revamp that I'm very excited about. Um, I will make sure to, to send that link out as well because um, I'm very excited. That has been a, a long labor of love. <laughs> um, you know, obviously this year we didn't have the summer library program workshops, um, you know, and I, I don't know if next year, if that, you know, later this year, next year, if that's something that we'll be able to pick up again. Um, but if you were able to attend any of the brainstorming sessions and, you know, you found them helpful or didn't, uh, the webinars, and then if you did click no or did not use for, for any of those, if you will also just tell me um, why, uh, because, you know, that's constructive feedback is really helpful for me to make sure that I am providing the most helpful information to you all. Um, and I also do provide that feedback up to the Collaborative Summer Library Program. Um, they do work two years in advance um, and so sometimes we may not see an immediate reaction to the feedback we're giving, especially if it's things like materials. Um, it might take them a year or two to be able to incorporate that back. Um, but, you know, additional information, or even if it's just, you know, I prefer to get my information somewhere else or my resources somewhere else, um, you know, please feel free to share that so I can make sure that I am, um, you know, tweaking and, and providing as much useful content as I can to you all. Okay. The last part of the survey consists of the open-ended questions. Uh, 
So when you submit your answers to these questions in the survey, we can collate the results and be able to use the stories for reporting purposes and hopefully to help others through their ideas as well. And even though one person per system is entering the summer data, you want every youth program person to be able to share their stories. So we'll be sending you the list of open-ended questions ahead of time so you can share. Uh, you can combine or list your responses. There's plenty of room in the open-ended fields. Um, this is to collect your success stories and your challenges. The questions ask about what you did differently this year, what worked for you, and about what needs you might have. And the question 22 is just a, a hair different than it was last year um, to share ideas for additional materials or resources that you would like CSLP to provide in the future. Um, we've always had the, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? I did add an optional question down there, and this was actually added um, based on popular demand. Um, you know, I've gotten so many questions just since I moved into this position about us collecting um, either the number of books that your kids are reading or the number of minutes or the activities. Um, and, you know, we, we aren't necessarily required to provide that information up to IMLS, but it is an important part of the story. And when I'm creating, you know, my, my post stats, infographic it's still fantastic to be able to include this information um, we also haven't you know there's really no one way to collect this information because every library does it so differently um, not all libraries are collecting a number of books read or you know some are, are doing timed reading some create community scavenger hunts where um, there are, there's literacy related activities as part of that scavenger hunt and so this is an open-ended question at the end. Um, you are not required to submit this unless you want us to just hear and see. Um, you know, it's been really exciting hearing from some of you all who've been able to tell me that, you know, last year your kids read 300% more than they ever have before. Um, those are fantastic stories. Uh, and it rounds out, you know, numbers are great, but they don't tell the whole story. So that is there as an option um, if your library would like to provide that information to us. Are we on the last data input screen? We are. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to say again, to make sure to save throughout the process of entering your data, just don't confuse it with the submit button. Um, and save, especially when you're when you're doing the open-ended questions, I, I would suggest save after each section. And once you're finished entering all the, all the data, please lock it in. Uh, there's a submit and lock button at the top and the bottom of the survey. If you do submit by accident before finishing or you need to revise something before the due date, contact one of us to reopen the survey. So save often, submit once, and once the due date hits, you can't go back and make changes. And I'm getting a question in the chat. Any chance we could get an MS Word version of the report we will be submitting so that we can draft it ahead of time for others in our organization to review for, before we submit? Um, you know what, Matthew, I am happy to do that for you. Um, I can send that out as an attachment as well. Um, and Nancy said, I am doing virtual and in-person events this summer so do i combine both attendance info together um nancy are you specifically talking about hybrid programming as in you have an in-person event that you are simultaneously live streaming or are you just talking about virtual and in-person in general
Let me give Nancy a minute to, to respond. Which is great anyway, because our next question was, any questions? <laughs> and we're about to go through an, um, a frequently asked questions here in a minute. Um, so Nancy said, we are doing virtual story times as well, and our summer reading is with actual kids. Um, so I, again, it boils back down to active programming versus self-directed, more so than in-person versus virtual. So if you're doing it live, whether it's virtual or in-person, that is active programming. If it's you know a video recording that they're viewing after the fact, that is self-directed. Not a problem. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions for now. So let's check out some of our frequently asked questions. And these were sort of based on emails I received last year, and then also just some frequent questions from, you know, when I first moved into this position and I went back and watched uh, several years worth of this uh, webinar when when Jana was in this position. Um, so we just sort of collected some of those questions that I heard come up a lot. So does the state count passive programs? Um, yes, we are now because they are part of self-directed programs. And so um, whether again they're passive or they're interactive, if patrons are able to do them whenever they want and staff are not live, then that is gonna be part of your self-directed. And then Nancy's gonna talk about, do virtual programs count as active or self-directed? That would depend. Um, a live event that uses streaming technology such as Facebook live stream, that would count as active. And a video of a live event posted on YouTube to be watched afterwards would be self-directed. And again, for those self-directed videos, we're looking for uh, a minute or more viewing. Do we count an activity as a program when a staff member is working one-on-one -on -one with a patron? So that depends. Um, you would not count it if the activity was originally intended for one-on-one -on -one interaction. Uh, you know, so if you're doing, you know, summer tutoring, which wouldn't really be part of a summer program per se, but um, you know, an activity that's really intended for one-on-one, -on -one, you would not count that. However, anybody who's worked in youth services for more than five minutes has probably found themselves sitting in a room by themselves with 15 pizzas and nobody to share them with. <laughs> Or one person shows up and then you're left trying to give away as much pizza to patrons as you can. Um, so if it was intended to be a group program and only one person showed up, then you would count it as a program. Do we count Facebook premiere videos? So I realize this is a very, very specific question. <laughs> it was a question I got a lot last year. For those who don't know what Facebook Premiere is, it's a way to schedule pre-recorded videos that look like they are playing live on Facebook. And so, um, you know, how do you count them? It really depends. So you don't count it as an active programming as an active program if the video is just scheduled and that's it um, if staff aren't act actively interacting with patrons during the video um, then you would just count that as a self-directed video you would count it as an active program if when the video is live staff are actively participating with participants and i know that there were libraries who very specifically used facebook premiere so that they could have their video playing like it was live because um 
you know, it people are probably more likely to stop if they see that something is live versus pre-recorded. But then it freed up those staff members to actively engage with participants during the course of that video. Um, and so that's sort of the difference there. Um, even though Facebook Premiere Video appears live, um, you wouldn't count it as an active program if it's just scheduled to go out and, and, and that's the end of it. It would be considered self-directed. And then which social media statistics do we pool? Um, so again, we've talked about this several times. Uh, you collect the video views that are one minute or longer. And then just to reiterate, the survey open and close days, July 19th, the survey will officially be open, but you don't have to wait until then to start collecting um, your data because many of you are already getting a start now on your outreach activities. Uh, but the survey closes August 20th, 2021. Um, but everybody is gonna be super amazing. And whenever I send you that login, you're gonna log in as soon as you get it just to make sure everything is working, right? <laughs> um, so yes, so that's all of what we plan to go over. And so any questions, I'm sure there are lots, I know that's a lot of information. Um, Sherry, yes, if you will click that hand raise button so you will pop to the top of my list, perfect. I have you unmuted. Okay, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, so for we have um, a make and take, but it has a live virtual component like at the end of the month. Hey, come show us what you made. Um, but I'm anticipating if we say give out 50 make and take bags, but only like 20 people show up to the virtual component. How do I count? Like I still want to count the 50 bags. Right, that so in. that would be the self-directed program. So you would count you know, if it's, I'm, I'm completely making this up. Unicorn craft make and take bag is a self-directed program, 50 attendees. Unicorn craft live video, 20 people show up. That's your active program. Okay. So I don't need to subtract like the 20 from the 50 no. or anything like that. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Of course. And we've got some great chat happening about story walks and copyright issues. And um, I know that that came up too during a couple of our brainstorming sessions. So if anybody's interested, definitely check out the chat. Are there any other questions about counting opinions or the stats that we are collecting? We tried not to make too many changes from last year to this year. Natalie, do we need to subtract our live video views from our total video view stats? Um, yeah, they should be separate. And I, and again, you know, social media they they change their their setup. It seems every other day. Um, but yes, yeah, so you're live. That's going to be your active program, and then whatever is post live webinar views, whatever language you know, YouTube or Facebook may use for that is going to be your self-directed. Because um, we don't want to double dip on statistics. Um, and, you know, while some programs were able to count two different ways, it's because we're, we're actually counting different things. Um, okay. So any other questions, again, feel free to hit that hand raise button if you'd like to use your microphone or we've got the chat available. Nancy said bags handed out is the active post to social media is what? Nancy, I don't, I don't understand, I'm sorry. The make and take question. So, um, 
so and and this was actually what we used as the example and you will all receive a copy of the powerpoint um so the the take and make in the live video was actually what we used in that table and i can um i'm happy to go back to that slide um the just the take and make part would be your self-directed program and then the live video would be a separate active program so i'll pop that up so y'all can see and i'm trying to make sure i'm not missing anything in chat here any questions i'm scrolling through Um, Julia said, if they post a, hey, I did a craft to our social media, does that get reported? No, not, I mean, because if, if they picked up a make and take, then you would have counted that make and take bag. If they attended a live video um, or they viewed it after, um, you know, to me, that would be like somebody picking up the phone and calling the library and saying, hey, I did this craft. Thanks for doing that. Um, you wouldn't really count that as part of this. But you, if they picked up that make and take, um, or even if it was, hey, join us at this time and day, here's the, um, you know, we're not giving you the supplies, but if you, um, you know, if, if you did a video on how to do, uh, you know, I make again, making this up, um, how to make slime, here's the stuff you need, you would be counting the video views as opposed to who all commented. Um, Jennifer, I came in late, but are we still calculating 2.7 per live view? Jennifer, I'm not sure where that 2.7 came from. Um, what I what I did say was that for really really for for programs that are virtual that are aimed at really young children like that early literacy age that you can make an assumption that there's an adult there um, so you could go ahead and double your count for that really young age because most you know two three four year olds are probably not logging onto Facebook by themselves I'm not sure where the two point seven is coming from. Yeah, and you can't make those assumptions for older children. Any other questions? We did schedule this to go until 1130, which is in about 10 minutes, um, but I certainly don't want to hold anybody here if you've got to run off. So I'm going to put up my contact information here on the screen. Um, and again, I will email this out. Please reach out if you have any questions, um, especially because I know, you know, last year everything was, um, you know, everyone was changing on a dime. And this year we have a year, you know, behind us. Um, but even that's bringing some new, some new questions and um, new opportunities. Thanks, Darlene. This was uh, taken at my library when I did um, primetime family literacy program. And part of that was we had to do in-person skits. So I did one promoting our summer library program theme. <laughs> so that's my contact information. And thank you so much, Nancy. It was so wonderful having you on the line to help with this. Well, it was a bit challenging <laughs> <laughs> for my first webinar, but anybody, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about the data or about counting opinions. Thank you, Peggy. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. Um, I'm going to hang out for a little bit or Daryl, it's not letting me hit stop recording. So if you will hit stop recording. <laughs> 
Um, but so I'm going to, I'm going to hang on the line in case anybody has some last minute, last minute questions, but I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. It's going to be a great summer. Um, you know, you all did an amazing job last year. So I